our rulers never took us seriously. I mean, I'm talking here us as people. They never took us seriously. They, they knew that, yeah, they might um, have few riots here, few riots there, uh, but they never dreamt even in their worst nightmares, you know, that, that they would ever face a, revol a, re a revolution like what uh, happened in 2011. A counter-revolution, by its very nature, presupposes that the status quo ante, that we're going back to the dictatorship of Mubarak. But your research shows that actually Sisi's uh, dictatorship is quite different from Mubarak's. Can you explain how you came to that conclusion? This is a common, um, I think, mistake that people uh, tend to fall into, uh, which is when they talk about a counter-revolution, they, they assume that a counter-revolution restores the old order. But the old order has failed. If, and it, if it hadn't failed, you wouldn't have had a revolution in the first place. I mean, I'm talking now through the perceived uh, eyes of the counter-revolutionaries. So while for people like you and I, the old regime had failed because of human rights violations, because of uh, social inequalities, uh, because of the lack of rights and political representation. For the counter-revolutionaries, um, the old regime had failed because it was too lenient. That's, that's uh, uh, the conclusion that they come up with. So the kind of regime that evolves out of victorious counter-revolutions, it's different. Even when you have some figures from the old regime still present and, and they are still around. And I don't think this is just in Egypt. I mean, when Germany, or we're now sitting in Germany, when the German revolution failed, you had the Nazis. When the Italian revolution failed, you had the fascists. Um, in, in Egypt, when the revolution uh, got crushed, it got crushed by whom? It got crushed by the younger military generals who back in 2011 thought that the older generals were weak and much more hesitant to crack down on protesters, who thought that Mubarak was too lenient, and these guys have decided that they could not depend on the Muslim Brotherhood any longer. They could not depend on any political force to stabilize the country. They will pacify the country uh, themselves. So the kind of regime that evolved after 2013 was not a restoration of uh, of Mubarak's regime in any sense. I know this is this was not really clear for, for many people in the beginning, including myself. I mean, I'm not saying that I had it all figured out in the, from the start. But as time progressed, um, we were, we all felt that we were up against something new. Now, as we're talking in 2023, I mean, I'm sure that everyone in Egypt feels and knows very well that they are under a different regime that that would make Hosni Mubarak look like a human rights activist in comparison. But my research these past years have have been trying to dissect this new regime through the prism of its repressive apparatus or its security services. And what I found out was the following. Um, this security sector in Egypt, as we know it today, um, while it definitely has its roots in the modern Egyptian state uh, when it was born under Muhammad Ali and then later when the Brits came and colonized it, this apparatus came into the shape that we know today in 1952 when the so-called free officers staged their coup against the Egyptian king and then later, uh, one year later, they declared uh, a republic. Now, this security sector was intentionally um, uh, fragmented by design from the start, where the military, the police, and the general intelligence service, which is our MI6, were fragmented. They were in a state of competition. Um, uh, they, there was very weak 
uh, channels of coordination between them. Most of the communication channels were vertical, not horizontal, so that only the ruler would have the bird's eye view when it comes to the situation. Why is that? It's because um, the whole purpose was coup-proofing the regime. A regime that came via a coup, what could have stopped the army of staging another coup against this regime? So our security sector had always been fragmented, all the way up until 2011. During these decades also, our rulers never took us seriously. I mean, I'm talking here us as people. They never took us seriously. They, they knew that, yeah, they might um, have few riots here, few riots there, uh, but they never dreamt, even in their worst nightmares, you know, that, that they would ever face a, revol a, a revolution like what uh, happened in 2011. And the street for them was just another tool that they themselves could mobilize in the fight of like one wing in the, of the regime against the other. Um, but the street acting as an independent agent, I mean, they, they denied us agency. When the revolution happened um, and our rulers got completely traumatized, obviously, by the situation, when they saw the gallows hanging in front of them, you know, for like two, a good two or three years, they decided two things. First is that they will pacify uh, the population um, um, depending on themselves, not on any other political forces. Secondly, is that they will restructure um, the security sector with a dominant perceived threat of popular unrest, not coup proofing. Uh, now, any autocrat, in order to stay in power for a long time, you know, he or she, mostly he, would have to shield himself, you know, from all dangers, you know, whether threat of coup, foreign invasion, uh, palace coup, or what have you. But there always has to be a dominant perceived threat. And according to it, you start organizing your security sector. This dominant perceived threat in the past was a military coup. Now it's popular unrest. So this meant that now the components of the repressive apparatus, the military, police, and the GIS are coordinating. They are much more unified. There is more um, uh, horizontal channels of communication. They share information. It's as if like they are united against us, uh, the people. And I've tried throughout my research to, to dissect basically, I mean, their, their workings. Um, and another also important feature that you have to keep in mind when you're dealing with this regime is that it's not only that the military generals have decided to pacify the country themselves, but they also have taken on the task of micromanaging society on a daily basis by themselves, not via other uh, uh, civilian institutions. Under Mubarak, there was a vibrant civil society, which on the one hand acted as a buffer <clears throat> between the state and society. So it meant that it, it would protect, protect society from the excessive intrusions of the state, but also it would, um, um, in the case of a revolutionary dissent, this civil society would protect the state because it would divert it in a reformist kind of way, not in an all-out uprising that can bring down the state. Sisi has destroyed the civil society. In the past, if, um, um, if there are um, abuses and violations and massacres happening in Palestine and there is so much anger in the streets in Egypt, the government could depend on the Muslim Brotherhood to diffuse this anger by limited protests that will be confined to the university campuses and to the mosques that will chant slogans against America and Israel but will not chant against Mubarak. Um, so things will be, you know, under control. If there is so much anger in society about the rising prices of basic commodities, then there, there were the Salafis that the state could depend upon in order to 
make these fiery, you know, sermons about uh, the reason for all the malaise we're in. It's because women are not veiled. It's because of the Christians. It's because of this. It's because of that. It's because of our morals. It's because we have departed from our morals. But would not mention Mubarak. If labor strikes uh, uh, broke out, even if we didn't have a vibrant independent union federation, but the government could depend upon the left-wing al party, which had presence in the workplaces to an extent, and could depend on the state-backed general federation of trade unions in order to diffuse the militancy in the work floor, try to reach you know, some compromise with the strikers, so as not to let things spill over and explode. Now, obviously, all of these mechanisms in the past did not prevent a revolution in 2011, but it kept the state alive from 1952 all the way till 2011. Now, CC has destroyed and demolished all of these institutions. There are no political parties any longer, no youth groups, no independent union uh, uh, networks. Most of the parties, even when they still exist on paper, you know, they, they really have lost their clout and their presence uh, in the streets. Even the, independent, the state-backed uh, uh, union federation, you know, it's, it has dwindled. It's not even being used. We don't have a ruling party in, in Egypt. Everyone knows that parliament is just a joke. I mean, under Mubarak, it was still a joke, but at the same time, it was a place where you can make compromises with other influential social groups in society. You can get them inside the political game, and they would stick to the rules of that political game. Under Mubarak, there was the ruling National Democratic Party, which was, yeah, I mean, it was unideological. Everyone knew that, you know, that they were just a bunch of opportunists. But they had representation in every single neighborhood in Egypt. So the state, before sending in the riot police to crack people's heads, there were so many layers that the state could depend upon before resorting to violence. Now the state has destroyed all of these networks, even the ruling National Democratic Party. I mean, they now have a party called Mustaqbal Watan, Nation's Future, um, which, you know, it's security services run, but it, it's not compared to the NDP, the ruling National Democratic Party at all. And they micromanage the population on a daily basis now, the security services. Well, on the one hand, this might be might be well for CC and the generals if things were going fine, meaning economically, if money was still showering them from everywhere, whether it's from the Gulf or from the West, if they could still um, subsidize and subdue the population via presenting services and, and economic aid, but once you hit this current economic crisis, um, where are your safety valves? He shot himself in the foot uh, and created this toxic formula, which in my view is not sustainable. <laughs>